and welcome to this lesson for higher biology which is looking at the environmental control of metabolism. So what we're mostly focusing on is how metabolism of specific microorganisms can be controlled by changing the environment in which they grow. So previous to now we have looked at how larger organisms and microorganisms can avoid adversity, so adverse conditions which will affect their metabolism. And what we're mo moving on to is how we can falsely or alter the environment around microorganisms or how we can change their genetics. So how it's possible to change uh, metabolism deliberately rather than it being changed by something outside um, or control, so looking at adverse conditions. So what you need to be able to do for this section is give some examples of microorganisms and explain why they can be found in all environments. You need to be able to describe the conditions required to grow microorganisms and how we may be able to adjust those in order to force the production of useful substances. And you also need to be able to describe the phases of growth in microorganisms in culture and give the methods by which growth is measured. So first of all, you need to know that microorganisms are found in all three domains of life, the bacteria, archaea, and also some in eukaryotes. Remembering eukaryotes are organisms which have a membrane-bound nucleus. Prokaryotes don't, and uh, both bacteria and archaea are examples of classes of prokaryotes. So archaea are similar in size and shape to bacteria, um, however, their metabolic processes can be quite different and this can occasionally make them actually more similar to eukary eukaryotes. So there's some similarities between these two groups, but they're different enough to be classed as two different groups. Now, there are many species of bacteria which are of economic importance to humans, so they might be involved in production of yogurt or cheese or biofuels, for example. Within our field of eukaryotes, we of course have fungi as microorganisms, um, which are eukaryotic cells, and these can be further divided into our yeasts and moulds, um, which may be used in industry or research. Archaea, as I said, are similar um, in size and shape to bacteria, but they have very specific metabolic processes, um, and this often means that they can be used in specific industries to produce particular products that we require. Now, microorganisms are wide-ranging and are able to use a wide variety of substrates for their metabolism. So we predominantly use glucose through the process of respiration um, in order to produce energy. However, species of microorganism can use a variety of different substances um, in order for their metabolism. And as a result, they can also produce a quite a range of products from their metabolic pathways. And this allows them extreme variability. They are able to survive in all environments on Earth. So you may find uh, microorganisms far deep under the sea, able to withstand huge ranges of pressure. Um, you may also find them in very, very hot conditions. Or, in fact, um, as these two were found in very, very cold conditions, and you may find them um, frozen in ice, for example, yet still surviving. So this extreme adaptability makes them very useful in industry because we can use them in very hot conditions. So, for example, if you consider PCR, our polymerase chain reaction that we looked at in the previous unit, that required a specific TAC polymerase bacteria, uh, sorry, a TAC polymerase enzyme which comes from a bacteria that's able to survive in very, very hot environments and very hot water. And as a result, we're able to use that particular enzyme from that bacteria in order to carry out DNA replication in a lab. So that's just one example of how we can exploit this extreme variability of bacteria to survive in very hot, very cold, very dry, highly pressurised environments. Now, microorganisms are particularly useful because they have some key features that make them very useful and have particular benefits. So they're very adaptable, they can be quite easily cultivated, um, they're going to grow very fast and they produce quite a wide range of products from their pathways which can be used for our benefit. When it comes to growing microorganisms, 
all microorganisms require a source of energy and some simple chemical compounds. These are their raw materials. And these raw materials will be used to synthesize their more complex molecules, which is a process referred to as biosynthesis. And the energy required for this can, may come from light, if it's a photosynthetic organism, or it may come from a chemical substrate. So when we are culturing or growing microorganisms, we need to produce these raw materials and any energy resources required in what we call a culture media. And this culture media could be a liquid broth like this one here, or it could be an agar jelly. And when we're using those ones in industry in particular, we tend to use large fermenters which contain all of the substances required for that growth of whichever bacteria or microorganism it is that you're, you're growing. Now when we're culturing microorganisms, we use usually a computer controlled fermenter in order to control the conditions. So one of the main things we need to look at first of all is temperature and controlling the temperature. So we have a temperature probe which is monitoring the um, temperature of the mixture and we may have some heating or cooling water to come in and that's going to surround it in this water cooled jacket. So a bit like the fermenter wearing a big hot water bottle. We're going to have this jacket surrounding our fermenter and that may be full of warmer water, full of colder water, depending on what it is that we're doing with the organism and what, what it, is it particularly requires. So we're going to have some water in and that's going to circulate around and we're going to take some water back out so we can maintain a steady temperature. We also need to maintain our oxygen levels, so we need to provide a sterile air supply and um, providing oxygen if it's an aerobic microorganism that we've got within our fermenter. We may need to consider our pH as well, so we maybe need to be putting um, specific nutrients to microorganisms or adding acid or alkali using a buffer solution. And we need to be able to keep it moving, um, so we've got stirrer in here moving things around and we're going to remove our product. Now it's also quite important that this is all sterile, we don't want any contamination from other microorganisms that we don't need. So there's a number of ways in which we can prevent contamination. First of all, we can heat sterilize um, all of our equipment and that kills microbes under high temperatures. We may use radiation sterilization such as UV waves or we may use chemicals like disinfectants or antiseptics. So looking at the growth of these organisms once they're in that fermenter, most microorganisms, their growth follows a very similar pattern. And you can see it on this graph here. This is the sort of stages we would be looking at for the growth of all microorganisms as a result of what they have present and as a result of the things they're producing. So if we look at growth of microorganisms against time, we've got time and we've got our number of cells. This is in a log scale, which we'll come to in a little while. But to look at the different phases involved in their growth, first of all, we start with the lag phase. So we've got little or no increase in our cell number. So we've put in a certain number of cells and as we come out of the lag phase, we have the same number. And essentially, this is because the cells have just gone into the conditions. They are adapting to the conditions and they may need to be induced or stimulated to start metabolizing the substrates that they've been given. We then move into the log or exponential growth phase and this is where our cells grow and multiply at the maximum rate and that prov providing that we don't have any limiting factors that we've managed to give them all of the required raw materials. And usually this means that the population is going to double its number with every cell division and this is going to increase exponentially. We then come into the stationary phase and this is where our nutrients begin to run out. We don't necessarily have too many cells dying off, but we're not growing at the same rate either. Now, this is often one of the most useful phases for us when we're using microorganisms in industry. At this stage, we often have something referred to as a secondary metabolite starting to build up. So our log phase involves the production of specific metabolites and those are just usually the ones required for growth um, and cell division. When we move into the stationary phase, we often, we've, we've grown, we've, we're there. So the organisms that remain, if they have enough of our raw materials, are able to start producing these secondary metabolites. And often these may be ones which would have conferred some kind of advantage 
while they were in the wild. So you may, for example, have some filamentous fungi, which would produce specific antibiotics. And in the wild, that would mean that if these fungi were present in soil, producing antibiotics would mean they would kill off any locally competing bacteria that they were growing alongside. However, in industry, we are obviously able to take those secondary metabolites, those antibiotics, and use them. That might be our final product required. We then come into the death or decline phase. And this is caused by lack of our nutrient substrate. Or it might be the accumulation of toxic metabolites. So often what might happen is within the stationary phase, the secondary metabolites, some of those may actually prove to be toxic to our microorganism when it's produced in a significant quantity. So as that starts to increase, that may become toxic. That results in a number of cells dying. And eventually we reach the point where the number of cells dying is greater than the number of new cells being produced. So the population starts to decline and it may disappear entirely or we may have a few individuals surviving as resistant spores. So knowledge of these growth rates is very important for microbiologists. Establishing how many cells you've got present will tell you a lot of things about the way your microbes are growing within their particular conditions. Now, in order to do this, there's a few different things we can look at. If these are our bacteria growing in a flask, you can look at what we consider to be the turbidity of our culture medium. So if this is where we start off with and this is what we end up with, turbidity really just refers to it's not so much a colour change as how many more cells that are present in our media which prevents us from being able to see through it clearly. Now obviously you would measure this using a colorimeter and as you can see this one against time it starts off paler and it's going to get thicker and more dense as time goes on as we grow more cells. So that growth of cells can be measured using a colorimeter in order to establish the turbidity. You may also be able to look at individual colonies using something called a hemocytometer, which is where you're going to take a section and you're going to count how many there are um, in each individual section of your grid. Now, it's important to realise that we have two different types of count. We have a viable cell count or a total cell count. And a viable cell count is where we count only the living microorganisms, whereas a total cell count would count both viable, so living, and our dead cells. So only a viable cell count would give you that death phase where you see that the cell numbers are decreasing. Now when we count those bacteria or microorganisms, we have very specific data gathered and it's usually quite large numbers when we grow bacteria. If they're doubling every 20 minutes or so, all of a sudden we can really increase quite significantly the number of, of cells that we have. That means when we plot those on a normal graph we don't necessarily see the uh, true representation of the type of growth. As a result we use instead a semi-logarithmic scale. Now this is where instead of our cell number being linear like it is up here we are using a log scale instead so instead of counting 10, 20, 30, 40 we're counting 1 to 10 and then we're moving up quite quickly to 100. Now this essentially means it doesn't really follow a linear progression in the same way as the one does over here. It's a semi-logarithmic scale because along the x-axis down here our time unit um, stays the same. We're not using a logarithmic scale for that. And essentially all that gives us a more accurate line drawn. So it's seeing more of that exponential growth the way that we would expect our cell numbers to grow. So from that, you should be able to give examples of microorganisms in all the domains of life, the archaea, bacteria and eukaryotes, and explain that they can be found in all environments as they have extreme variability in terms of the substrates that they're able to use and the environmental conditions at which they can withstand. You should be able to describe the fact that we require specific conditions to grow microorganisms. We may need a specific temperature and pH, and they're also going to need their raw materials and any energy sources, whether that be a chemical substrate or whether that be light, and that we can change or adjust these in order to ensure that our 
microorganisms are, will be able to produce the useful substances that we require. That the phases of growth in microorganisms are fairly standard and give us four phases, the lag, log, stationary and death rate phases. And we can count those that growth by using either turbidity, me measured using a colorimeter, and this may involve a viable cell count, counting living microorganisms, or a total cell count where we've got both viable and dead cells. And that data itself would be plotted on a semi-logarithmic scale in order to give us a more representative line. As ever, feel free to ask any questions when we go over this in class.